Okay, hi everybody. Today we're going to continue our foray into uh, perception, our first, uh, our first explorations of perception. And if you remember, the goal is to, that's what it says when it's loading. Let me just, let me do it from scratch, how about that? So uh, you should know, by the way, all the demos I show are right there for you to run, right? So how many people are actually running the notebooks from the lecture notes? A few, yeah? Um, but let's just say they're, they're right there to run. If you just run the pose notebook in the pose chapter, then you'll see exactly the demo that we're sort of working up towards, right? Which is, and we've, we've already got all the basic components now. So we've, someone took a mustard bottle we took a moment to scan the mustard bottle, so we have a known model. Now it, there's a mustard bottle in the bin with a bunch of cameras looking at it. And we're going to use our point cloud processing to find that mustard bottle and then use that now, that information of the pose of the object in order to plan our grasp the same way we did last time. Okay? So that's what we're working towards. And we talked about, yeah. So you could, um, one way to make a model would be to take your object and try to see it from lots of different angles uh, and make a point cloud of it to start. That's a perfectly reasonable way to do it. Oftentimes when you're in the wild though, then you know, you're never going to see the bottom of the, of the mustard bottle, depending on where your cameras are. So that would typically take a separate step where you put it in a scanner or something like that. Uh, in fact, that's kind of what we did here. The way I made those, those, those point clouds was I just put a camera, a bunch of cameras at it and sampled and downsampled and, uh, and worked from that. Yeah? The question is, does, would you improve performance to use the same camera? I think that um, you know, point clouds are a pretty robust representation. So, and by the time you often, some of the processing will do as we work with them more, uh, you'll downsample and the like. Uh, so you're pretty agnostic to the camera. In fact. A lot of people, you'll hear people say things like, I chose to use depth in this project instead of RGB because it's less sensitive to the camera properties. So, uh, and the lighting conditions and things like that. Okay, so last time we worked through some of the mechanics and we'll go through um, extensions of that today, but we ended up with the iterative closest point um, algorithm, right? So. Talked about point clouds. We talked about point set registration. First with known correspondences. And that one had a beautiful solution which happened to just require calling SVD and had a, basically a linear algebra solution. Uh, and then for unknown correspondences, we so far, we introduced the ICP algorithm, the iterative closest point algorithm, right? And I showed an example that was admittedly uh, a best case for it, right? Where the orientation wasn't so bad and uh, the iterative closest point algorithm worked by Finding correspondences based on nearest neighbors, just taking the points in the scene, the points in the model, saying they're corresponding if they're the closest one, and then assuming that was correct, solving for the pose given the known correspondences, and then updating and running until convergence. Now, if you play with the notebook in the, I, I intentionally made random objects and random initial conditions, you'll see lots of cases where that also fails, right? So. When you start with a good initial guess, it very reliably can, can in, a, in a small number of steps, converge. It's, like a, it's got a nice finite convergence property, okay? But it's also easy to get it confused, where it starts corresponding with wrong, uh, in wrong ways, and it will never get unstuck, okay? So this problem has local minima when you separate out the closest point from the, the 
pose estimation. Okay, but we're going to work to try to, you know, do better than that and also even think about some of the other uh, limitations of this today. So my, my goal for today, uh, the main goal for today, is to, to start working with more real-world point clouds. So I'll just call them messy point clouds. And uh, we'll, we'll think about, we'll go from hard correspondences before. I'll introduce what I mean by soft correspondences and talk about a lot of generalizations to this basic ICP algorithm, some of which can be extremely effective. We'll talk a little bit about specifically about dealing with outliers. Okay, and then I want to make sure we talk a little bit about um, sort of beyond just correspondence-based So what would you do if you wanted to add constraints to the optimization? Or, or what other sorts of information can you get from knowing that you've got a depth camera that isn't available in the simple point set registration uh, objective? Okay. So that's the main goal. Let me just start um, quickly by telling you a little bit more about how we simulate uh, point clouds, okay, and simulate cameras in, in, in Drake, but in general, okay. So this is the same kind of system you've been familiar with, but I put in uh, this RGB sensor in the middle here, okay, which is an, just another block in our block diagram. It connects directly to the scene graph, which has all the geometry information, and it outputs a color image, a depth image of different, uh, you can choose different resolutions of the depth image. It optionally takes a label image and tells you exactly which pixel corresponds with which object. But that's, of course, a cheat that you wouldn't have in real world. Okay. And you can ask for it to, to output the, the poses and stuff too. Okay. Now, even though that's just a simple system in this picture, that's underneath there is an entire rendering pipeline that's you know fairly sophisticated rendering pipeline. We have a few different options when you when you do RGBD sensors in Drake, you can use the standard sort of OpenGL-based pipelines. Those are fast, and they run at sort of simulation rates. Or you can do a remote process call to Blender or some other uh, you know, ray tracing or a higher quality uh, renderer of your choice if you want to make, uh, make pictures that are sufficiently rich to maybe train a perception system or impress your friends with fancy movies. Okay. So, but these are all, you know, in the systems framework, they're just on one more block in our diagram. Okay, but down in the, de down in the depths, they're doing a lot of uh, rendering work. Okay, I also put in um, an extra piece in this diagram to um, extract, to take the depth image out and project it into the 3D. So I guess I didn't highlight this, but this says depth image to point cloud. Okay, but this, um, this thing right here immediately puts, puts out a color image and a depth image. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what I'm, that's coming. Yeah. So, okay. So, so in practice, I put that in manually just so you at least once see what the system looks like and that understand what's, what's happening. But in practice, the we have this hardware station abstraction. Okay, and you listed a bunch of objects in the scene, okay, you can just add one more thing into your YAML file and say there's a camera. You can talk about the properties of, those ca of that camera right in the YAML file. And if, if effectively, you just uh, you know, add one, a couple more lines to your YAML file and suddenly you've got a camera in there that can, will automatically add the RGBD sensor system into your, in the inside of your hardware station and will make those output ports available in the hardware station abstraction. Right, the goal of the hardware station abstraction is to be whatever the real robot is. That's the boundary. Okay, so if the so we actually don't put, we don't make point clouds come out of the hardware station ever because the robot doesn't going to send you point clouds. It's going to send you a depth image. Okay, so that's the layer of abstraction, the hardware station. 
And so the thing that converts from the, the depth and color to a point cloud, that would be outside the hardware station because you're going to have to do that even if you're on a real robot. So, so, but in general, you know, one more line. It, it happens. It looks like I did more lines. That's because I just I put a <coughs> I put the camera geometry in the scene too, right? So, and then I just said there's a camera where the camera geometry is, basically. But you didn't. If you just want to have an invisible camera in the sky, you don't need you don't need the camera model, right? Okay, so then inside that uh, abstraction of the hardware station, we have the multi-body plant, the scene graph, the RGBD sensor all on the inside. And then if you want to also put the, convert it to, to point clouds, then there's another system that converts it to point clouds outside. And then if you want to send those point clouds to MeshCAD, there's one more system you can, you can publish it with. So what does that give you? That gives you something like this. Uh, here we go. Right, it gives you scenes like this, but in, in MeshCat, when you publish both the original geometry, that's under the Drake thing, and the point cloud that gets published, okay, that's this camera, which you can see behind my box here. Oh, I forgot to put the camera in this one. I ran it fresh, the new one has the camera in it. Okay. Uh, but this is actually, even though that looks beautiful from this side, that's actually just the point cloud colorized with the RGB values. Okay, and it immediately shows one of the limitations of using cameras, right, is partial views, right? You're only going to see one side of the mustard bottle with one camera. Okay. But like I said, we talked last time sort of assuming we had a, you know, the, the luxury of making a very nice model and then the luxury of having a perfect uh, depth camera, okay? But real point clouds are actually messy. This is just some real data of our messy lab. Uh, this is what, if I were to have ideal depth would look like, and this is more like what the real depth looks like. And we're gonna talk about the specific ways that they're messy. Uh, in a few minutes, okay, and there's, I just grabbed another random desktop manipulation. One of the other things people say often about the D415 in particular, it's funny, like, all sorts of people have all commented, they always use the same word, they're like, they always say it's kind of lumpy. Like, lumpy doesn't, I don't think I, I've ever used lumpy really in my, you know, but everybody chooses that word because it's just kind of, it's kind of lumpy, okay. Um, and that's just the limitations of, of being, you know, when you're that close, you know, the, the accuracy of that sensor and the, somehow the way it's doing its stereo matching, it has that property, that, which makes it very hard to detect vegetables very accurately. If your bumps, your lumps are on the same order of, you know, same scale as the things you're trying to manipulate, that's, that's bad news. Okay, yeah, so I made the partial views. So how do you get around partial views? There's many ways to do it. You could have a mobile manipulator that can sort of look around, you know, and take multiple views. Um, in the dish example that I showed you before, we, have, we put cameras everywhere. It, it doesn't uh, mitigate completely the partial view problem. Still, when you're in, come looking in the sink, you know, you're not going to see the bottom of the plate, for instance, or the bottom of the mustard bottle. Okay, but at least I'll get as many views as I possibly can looking in. And that's kind of a common thing if you're seeing a, uh, instrumented robot station, you'll expect to see multiple cameras all looking down. And, um, and don't, if you see that, don't knock the cameras. That's just not cool. Because uh, then someone has to go back and calibrate everything again, you know. So if you're visiting a lab and you see lots of cameras, you know, don't touch. Uh, okay, even this one has, you know, two on the wrist. So it tries to see just about everything. Okay, so let's just think about some of the, some of the problems. So um, in what ways are point clouds messy? Okay. Um, types of messy, I guess I'll write. One of them, which I'm trying to show here, is partial views. Uh, 
And <clears throat> let's think for a second about uh, what partial views would do. So if I had my blue model and my salmon uh, you know, object and I was trying to register them together, how is ICP going to do with the partial view problem? Now you, you remember that um, we specifically chose that we were going to write the correspondences last time. We said C, um, CI equals J means that um, scene point I corresponds to model J. Okay, so we went to some lengths to say that for every scene point, there is a, we have to you know, have a corresponding point in the model, but not the other way around. Right? We did not say in that representation that every model point had to have a corresponding point in the scene. This is a major reason why, is that for partial views, you can ex sort of expect in the perfect case, you know, but th where you just didn't see the back half, but you got noise-free, you know, points, then this is okay. This is going to do still fairly well. It can still get stuck in local minima and the like, but it has a chance of being successful. This is an example of a local minima, but it had a chance. If I had run it a bunch of times, it would have worked some of the time. Okay, another problem is just sort of Gaussian noise. Let's just say Gaussian noise. Or lumps, maybe. That's not a technical term. That's just me being silly. But, uh, okay. <clears throat> um, the real sensors, yeah, really don't have Gaussian uh, kind of error characteristics, but people often will use that in their point cloud algorithms. It's a little suspicious, probably, uh, because, in fact, when you're solving the least squares problem, which is the known correspondence problem, right, the least squares problem that we wrote down a bunch last time, and we'll write down again in a minute, that's actually very robust to Gaussian noise. Right? It's, it's going to solve that correspondence. It's going to look for the pose, which minimizes the least squares objective. So if you add a little Gaussian noise in, it's sort of designed to fight that Gaussian noise. Unfortunately, you know, real sensors give lumps more than Gaussian noise. Okay, the other one that you'll, you'll get is outliers. And you can get sort of a little bit of outliers, or you can get um, a lot of outliers. So, so one thing you could sort of imagine would be, you know, I've, I've looked at my mustard bottle, but I accidentally got a, a, a few, I don't know, shiny points over to the side, so I got a few pixels. If I had my, my objects You know, maybe I have my my objects, or my my point, my scene points that look kind of like this. You know, it's pretty recognizable. Okay, but now I had like two sort of just random outlier scene points. If I do my existing objective, right? If I try to minimize x in SE3, you know, the sum over i of some x that I'm looking for, mci minus That was the objective we wrote down last time, right? Which we can solve nicely if the correspondences are known. Okay, what happens to my sort of ICP algorithm when I do this? When I introduce a few outliers? Yeah. Yeah, these, the squared error here is going to be large, so, it, so it's going to actually have a, a measurable effect on the pose you estimate. So even though it, you, you know, it gets like, obviously I would want to try to fit the object over here, it's very likely, if we're demanding that all of the C 
seen points have a corresponding model point. And because it's going to pick some model, some point for this, you're going to end up with a, you're more likely going to end up with a, um, you know, a fit that looks something like way over here. You know, this, these are going to have, you know, a large effect compared to the ones that are all sort of close. Okay, so that's a, that's a problem the way we've written it. Interestingly, if you want to be robust to outliers, one thing you could do, which is sort of seems natural, you could write your correspondences the other way. You could say that every point in my model has to correspond to a point in my scene. And then these will just get ignored. But, right, if I said that the other way, if I said every point in my model has to correspond to one of the points in my scene, then the fact that none of the points in my model correspond to those points is fine. But then you're susceptible to partial views. Right, so the correspondence of going scene to model is good for partial views. The correspondence of going model to scene is good for outliers. But unfortunately, we need to really be good at both. Okay, so, we're good. so one of the goals here is to generalize our, our notion of correspondence a bit so that we can try to be robust to both. All right, so let's do that. The first notion, we'll, the first way we'll do that is with this notion of soft correspondences. Okay, so let me do it. I'll stick. I'll, I'm going to work towards soft correspondences, but first let me just make a small change to the sort of this formulation that could uh, you know, open up the possibility of corresponding not all to, to something in one direction. Okay, so instead of my correspondence vector, let's do a correspondence ma matrix. We'll say C i j, and it's going to be zero or one, and I'll say it's one if scene point i. corresponds to model point J. Okay, so certainly this is enough to, this can capture what we've written before. If I just have, if I just fill in the diagonal kind of entries of this, I can make, I can represent this perfectly with that. And I could actually represent either one. I could do the model to scene or the scene to model fine with that. But you can also potentially have model points that aren't corresponding to any scene points or scene points that don't correspond to any model points. Okay. The price you pay for that, though, is that now you have to sum, you're going to solve a slightly more expensive optimization problem. I'll sum over i and sum over j, c i j m i, which one did I say? Like m j here minus p s i. Okay, that doesn't sound like, you know, does it like it looks kind of painless or you're harmless um, to just have one more sum there, but if you've got a thousand points or a million points in your point cloud, then this can actually be the difference between running at real time versus not running at real time, having to do that, going to n squared for your big point cloud. Okay, so this is a more general formulation, but it's more computationally expensive. Is that clear? I mean, I don't want the algebra to be a trick. It looks like a trick, but it, I, before I tucked my correspondences in here, and now I've done it by just turning on and off the terms in my sum. So that's a slightly more general, and it allows you to, like I say, handle um, a more flexible mapping. It also leads to the, the possibility of having 
softer correspondences. Okay, this is hard correspondences if it's still zero or one, but soft correspondences. Could be if I have C, let's say IJ takes values between 0 and 1, for instance. I could say I correspond to that point a little, a little bit, right? Or I could correspond to many points. I mean, even this one could correspond to many points, but you could maybe if you want to correspond uh, you know, a little bit to lots of points, that can be a more uh, a softer version of this correspondence. Okay, but in that same, if, if you're allowed to, if you're willing to do the double sum, then then this is a you know a flexible thing. And the question becomes, how would you choose Cij? Right. So before we chose to say something was corresponding if it was, you know, based on a nearest neighbor query. We need a heuristic now to say, or some sort of mechanism now to pick Cij in this more general sense. Okay. So one of the ideas out there would just be to use something like a Gaussian kernel, okay? I'll say what I mean by that, okay? And this is the coherent point drift CPD algorithm, which is a, a variation on ICP that does this sort of soft correspondence with Gaussian kernels. Okay, so maybe the way to think about it, I've already got a picture started here. If I have my model points. And my scene points, okay, if I think about, you can do it either way around, but if I think about putting um, sort of a Gaussian kernel, that's, these are level sets of my, my two-dimensional Gaussian around every point, then I'll basically score the distance, but it's weighted and it'll, it'll ramp off. On the tail. So I'll just compute the distance between all of the points. Again, an n squared kind of operation. Okay. I'll compute the distance to all of them, but I'm going to, instead of just using the distance straight up, I'm going to weight the distances that are far away from me uh, more and, and have the, the distances that are close be more in a bell shape, in a Gaussian. It's a, you know, the Gaussian, of course, brings extra probabilistic interpretations around and it keeps the objective looking like a quadratic function and stuff, so the, the Gaussian is a natural choice, but the, the essence of the idea is really just, you know, taper off, make my values close to zero if the points are far away, and closer to whatever the, you know, Gaussian uh, when you're, you're close to zero, okay? And, and then you could normalize that so that, the, so that the sum is one if you want across those points. That's a, just a normalization coefficient that we can solve naturally enough. The normalization, you know, may matter to, if some points have lots of neighbors and other points don't have not, lots of neighbors. Okay, so it's just imagine like putting rubber bands between you and all of your neighbors. Okay, but there's somehow sort of a nonlinear band. That's a pretty robust, good way to do um, a more general form of correspondence. And you see in all of these papers, by the way, you always see the Stanford Bunny. Somehow the Stanford Bunny just won that that game, okay? And you'll see them all, you know, adding things that will, tr for instance, add a lot of outliers, add a lot of partial views, okay? This is the CPD paper, coherent point drift paper, which shows that, you know, this thing can be, can have pretty robust registration even with lots of noise and potentially lots of outliers, okay? The general word on the street is that CPD is a lot more robust than ICP, but it's a lot potentially a lot more expensive that you get these n squares that pop in a few times. There are algorithms out there that try to try to do almost CPD, but in the um, staying in the linear regime, and they can be a pretty nice trade-off in between. OK, 
Okay, so messy point clouds require, I think, a general, a more general thinking about correspondence. Good, I should have said that all the way through. Um, so this is still an iterative algorithm, okay? So on step, uh, given an initial value of x, initial guess, which is kind of what I've illustrated here, I've got a guess for where the model is, and a, a observations of the scene. Given that initial guess, now I can compute the distances and score them with a Bell curve, okay? And that allows me to compute these coefficients. And then I solve the point registration problem that's weighted by this, which is again an SVD based operation. And then I alternate. And so it's going to snap in and it'll have some of the same local minima properties that the original iter ICP does, but it's going to be less immediately susceptible because it's going to kind of average out the local correspondences. Great. Thank you for making me say that. Yeah. Yeah, so you have to be careful about your normalization. That's correct. So he says maybe we, you don't want to normalize for outliers. So um, yeah, so let's just think about that for a second. So what, how does CPD handle outliers, right? By default, it's handling outliers by setting a very small weight. You know, C should be very close to zero or zero effectively for things that are far away, right? So if you had, if it was the case that you were corresponding to only outliers, I mean, then I think, I think in that setting, then, you know, maybe they're not outliers, <laughs> right? If, if they're the only points that I'm nearby, right, then, then I should actually attach myself to them to maximize the objective, right? Um, so I think there is a canonical normalization of CIJ, and they, they use it in the paper for sure. Yeah. Beautiful. So, so that I was going to make that point next. So, so yeah. So, what is an outlier in the real world? I, I drew a cartoon of an outlier being like two points. Okay, but if I if I have a, a cluttered scene, okay, and a mustard bottle sitting in the cluttered scene, I'm going to get point cloud returns from all of the other objects in the scene, including the desk, including you know everything. So, actually, it can often be the case that like you know 90% of your points are outliers in that sense. And now the problem is sort of finding a needle in the haystack. Okay, so if you if you start with just an ICP or co CPD kind of framework in that, you're going to need to have a fairly good initial guess. Otherwise, you're likely to get you know get your mustard bottle attached to the chair or something like this. Okay, because of that, although people do do that, and there's cases I'll show you some, a couple of times where that can be useful. Um, oftentimes now nowadays segmentation you know with deep networks is so good that you'll typically do segmentation first. And then give yourself a small crop nearby and try to identify there. And then you're in a picture where you know you have some returns maybe in your in your box, but it's not as as much as finding the mustard bottle in you know, Rome. You'll you'll know why I said that in a second. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, partial views would still be, so if, if, let's say I'm using an RGB neural network based segmentation, they would still be able to go from that camera view and say, this is the area of interest, and then in, I can map that through the geometry of the camera into the 3D and make a box and, and make the cuts. So partial views in that pipeline are fine. There was a more classical point cloud based way to do segmentation. Those would be maybe potentially more susceptible to segmentation. Uh, to partial views in the segmentation, uh, but but the neural network ones are pretty pretty darn good. Yeah, so you might you might have like a lot of times people would just find a mustard bottle on a flat table, so they would identify the table and they would subtract it out, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of different potential ways. So 
So again, a, a deep network. So, so neural networks are going to be very good at solving the more global problem, right? So if you really have to sort of look at a big cluttered scene and, and start with an initial guess, then you know, it's very hard to do better than a neural network for something like that. Okay. Uh, sometimes, I mean, networks can be amazing, you know, deep learning can be amazing for even the final step two, for the pose estimation step two. But um, oftentimes using the geometry can do better in the local uh, to get the accuracy of like dialing in your pose very accurately. So where there was a long time where people would do deep learning to get an initial guess, geometric perception to fill in the details and snap it into place. Yeah. There's leaderboards on the pose estimation. And around 2020, they kind of flipped to, it, it was long, you know, deep learning happened, deep, deep learning and computer vision happened you know, much earlier, 2016, let's say, okay, but uh, they only started beating the geometric versions in the leaderboards around 2020 or so, 2021, but now they're, they're just winning. Yeah. Good. So let me repeat it for, for everybody to hear. So, yeah, so I assumed I, I, all my pictures of the sort of drawn uniform samples across the object, right? If I were to shine a camera or do less careful things, I, you know, I, I might have had a, a bunch of points in my model over here and maybe not as many on this side. There's really no reason to expect the, the scene to be distributed as nicely around the boundary of the object as the model was, or, or you know, not even nicely, just they could be different, right? So that's, I think the soft correspondence is also address that, right? So you don't have to have, it's less requiring you to match exactly one. If you were to have CIJ being 0 0.5, 0 0.5, imagine a setting where, you know, my, my scene and my model are almost on top of each other. Let's say my, my model points came spaced like this, and with perfect alignment, my scene points came like this, or I, yeah, model scene, right? I could still drive this objective to zero. I could correspond to, to both of them. No, it wouldn't be zero, but it would be a minimum. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another reason to, to use the, the generalized correspondences. Yes? X is my pose, yeah? This X is my, my rigid transform. So when I say SE3, that means it's got to be a valid uh, it's going to be a, a three positions and some valid rotation. And in the the math here, we can we, we're using our spatial algebra in that in that writing. Okay, but the ba the main idea here of this iterative algorithm is that I'm going to deal with outliers uh, and you know noise and uh, and other things and partial views but outliers by setting this to a very small number. And it's alternating. It's using the, the previous guess, the distances from the previous guess to set those thresholds. And then it's solving this in effectively closed form with the singular value decomposition. But a generalization of that, which has different computational properties, but, but more flexibility, okay, I could just say, what if I wanted to use you know, the distance here? This is already my quadratic bowl. Okay? What if I just said things that have a really large distance shouldn't cost me more? What if instead of just using a quadratic function here, which just got worse and worse and worse, what if I said you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obtain error from being far away, but then it just flattens out? So there's a, you, know, you can do exactly this without the alternations, with a small change where you could say, I'm going to minimize over, I'll write the sum like this, but that still means my, my two sums potentially. Some more general loss function of
It doesn't have to be quadratic. It could be quadratic and trying to do some of the same things that the Gaussian was doing. Yeah. Yeah, so, so there's a bunch of squared exponential. Uh, I mean, that's kind of what a Gaussian is, I guess, right? Um, there's a couple sort of canonical choices. So the quadratic, if I just use the quadratic, you would think of that as, as uh, a parabola that goes up, you know, quadratically, right? And therefore, large distance objects, outliers, are going to have a very, very large effect on my cost. Okay? You can do a little bit better if you, if you use a Huber loss that has a, at least a linear scaling after the initial growth. Okay? That turns it into a linear scaling. But actually, the Gaussian that we're doing here, uh, like in CPD, it has an interpretation. If you think of it in this, this way, it's sort of the, the cost of going farther out tails off. And now it's a subtle point, okay? So the fact that this is flat for large distances, it doesn't have to be zero in this picture. It just has to be flat. You still want it to cost more to have a point far away from you than if you had one that was perfect, okay? But it stops affecting my optimization because changing my... If, I'm, if I've got a flat line over here, then small changes in my estimate of the pose will not affect the cost I get back. So that the, the ones that are in the flat part of the curve have no effect on the optimization. So the most extreme version of that would be a truncated least squares, where you just say, if the distance is less than 1, for instance, then I'm going to use the quadratic. And if it's greater than 1, then it's just 1. So that'll, pen, that'll reward you for making as many inliers as possible, because an inlier will always get less cost. You want your outliers to cost at least as much as the worst inlier, right? But then it, the outliers are, don't, you know, don't affect your pose, effectively. Okay, so that's, those are the, the standard cast of, of objective choices. Now, when I, when I, once we go into that space, you're now leaving the world of quadratic programming or SVD, and you're going to typically do nonlinear optimization to solve for that. Right? So, when we had originally, we had cost functions. I had decision variables like this and cost functions like this. We were, we've so far been in the land of these nice convex objective functions that have unique minima, okay, but this would be a sort of a convex optimization. These are going to lead to non-convex optimizations. In general, just because it's a richer class, okay, so if I have my decision variables x, my costs I could have cost landscapes that are more complicated, right? Probably not negative in this particular problem, but um, and I'm going to potentially have a harder time optimizing against these functions because they could have more local minima. Okay, so that's the thing to watch out for, but it's really empowering to be able to use these richer things that deal very naturally without, with outliers. The truncated least squares in particular there's ways to address that with kind of a logic where you do beautiful quadratic optimization, you know, and there's a, you can turn these on or off. And so there are nice convex optimization approaches to solving that one, that hard non-linearity. Non but in general, you're in this harder problem space. Yeah, typically it's, it's you want to, it's typically a heuristic, right? Some, some sort of, I mean, um, yeah, maybe it has to do with the confidence you have in your model or the, set, the, set, the noise characteristics of your sensor or something like this. There are, tip, there are rubrics, I guess, but people normally just say, eh, one, you know. And then if, it does, if it's getting stuck, you change it to 0.5 and you hope. Yeah. yeah, that can be a little heuristic. Okay, so but but that's an extremely powerful toolbox. 
And once you go there, there's a lot of things you can do to make the computations really fast, for instance. So one of the cool ideas that I like is if you're going to be doing lots of, um, lots of distance queries from points to your, ob to your model, then one of the things you can do is you can take your model and pre-compute a sign distance function over 3D space. How many people know what the sign distance function is? Have you seen those before? They, this is the best picture I, I could find. It's from Pete, who's awesome. Okay, but um, yeah. So imagine we have our 3D Stanford bunny or something. But here's a 2D slice of the Stanford bunny. That, that sounded mean. Uh, okay, and so in that slice, we're gonna we're gonna have a picture that takes negative values, so it has a negative distance to the object when it's in the inside. Okay, it's zero on the boundary of the object in all three dimensions, of course, right? And it gets the distance, the actual distance to the closest plane on the boundary everywhere. Right? That's a function you can sort of pre-compute once for each model. And now, you know, distance queries become just lookups, right? You don't even have to sample your bunny. You can just have you work directly from the original mesh, for instance, okay? And now if I want to know quickly what, what's the distance from this point to there, it's just a table lookup. In this setting, it, that just makes things a lot faster and very GPU compatible and, and the like, okay? Sign distance functions are, are important, one of our many representations that I mentioned, but for this particular optimization, they're very effective. Yeah? Uh, that might be how you generate this, right? So, so the, the question is, how would you compare this to a Euclidean distance? The sign distance function is, you know, a Euclidean distance defined to be, you know, the, what's the minimum Euclidean distance from any point from this point? The value of the sign distance function would be the minimum Euclidean distance to any point on the boundary. Okay, typically it's Euclidean, and then similarly, it'd be minimum distance here. But you know, I'm going to sign this myself, if, if you will, on the inside. That's how you would compute it. But the point is. If you're going to be doing lots of queries all the time, don't do that minimum over boundary points every time. Pre-compute it once and then do the table lookup. Yeah. So how do you compute? How do you compute that? So it turns out that that if you represent it even at a finite number of points and interpolate, then these can be like surprisingly good. In voxels, yes. So a voxel-based representation, to, if, you wanted to if you wanted to just use that as your representation of the geometry, there's an algorithm called marching cubes that will go and look at the voxel-based representation and find the boundary to try to find the zero level set. And you'll see geometry that comes out of this that's like, you know, as good as, you know, in fact, this is probably one of those, that as good as like a, any CAD file, okay, but it's actually represented with a fairly coarse voxel grid. I was, I, I, when I started looking at that, I was like, wow, that's, I'm, I'm impressed at how coarse your voxel can be with the level of, of resolution you can get out of your mesh. Nowadays, people will store that in a neural network. Okay? You can, deep SDF, in fact, is the, was one of the first to do that, right? So uh, you could just have a neural network function over R3 that says, what's my sign distance? And then you can, to, to try to figure it out, you just find the zeros of the neural network output to reconstruct your object. And that turns out to be a very, very powerful representation. Yeah. Because it allows you to, to play these games with outliers, for instance. You can, yeah. Um, they are all trying to be good for outliers in the sense that they're flattening out over here. They will have different, this might be a slightly harder, if you just handed this to a general nonlinear optimizer, that might be a harder optimization landscape, okay? But, but it would be very uh, specific about outliers. Cool, yes. Good, so, so how would you do optimization on this? So there's a, there's a toolbox of nonlinear optimizers that people will use. A natural choice would be, I'm gonna pick a point here and just start going down and doing gradient descent. So um, oftentimes, when we get into these non, 
convex optimizations. We'll also have constraints. If you're doing constrained optimization, then people will, um, will do, for instance, second order methods that can handle constraints more naturally, or you have to do projected gradient descent. We're gonna evolve those tools when we need them. Yeah, so I think gradient descent is a perfectly reasonable model, and that's why it can potentially get stuck in local minima. But, but again, you could do, you can make local quadratic approximations and try to do faster optimization that way, or handle constraints more naturally. Okay, so that was like a, I actually, in the notes, I went through many of the variations of, of ICP, okay, and there's some that are just super clever. Like they're really, really clever at how you can deal with outliers, how you can use, remember last time we talked about the, um, you can use the pairwise distance to do scale estimation because it's invariant to translation and rotation. Okay, so you can use those same sort of invariant features to try to find correspondences. There's so many clever tricks, okay? You can use color values to try to, or features some, to somehow try to find correspondences. There's lots and lots of tricks. And I tried to give you a, a summary of them sort of in the notes, but this is the main idea I wanted to communicate here. Because correspondences aren't everything. And I want to make you know, some time to talk about what are the limitations of this? And what, are we have, what have we not done now? And why do we need something a little bit more than correspondences? Okay. And I guarantee if you put a mustard bottle or a mug or something on the table and you get your nice fancy real sense camera out and you do your ICP on a real, in the real world, you're, you're going to hit this thing, which is just everybody hits it. It's really annoying, okay? Let me do it maybe with a mug, just because I can't draw mustard bottles very well, okay? So let's say I've got a table here in 2D, okay? And I've got my mug sitting on the table, and ICP is going to come back, okay? And it's going to say, like, I don't know, here's your estimate of the mug. And it fits you, it minimizes the least square sense, okay? And you're going to be like, that's not my estimate of mug, it's in the table. I know the mug's not in the table, right? Uh, and then you'll have another sample return, okay, where, you know, it's going to say, here's my estimate of the mug. You'll be like, I know the mug is not floating in space, right? And so there's things that you know about the optimization problem that you haven't told that ICP, the sort of correspondence only objective, is not rich enough to express. Okay, so correspondences aren't everything. There's other information, like non-penetration as a constraint. You know, this is, so how would you think about that? What, what's the constraint that you would write? Non-penetration just means two bodies should obviously not be penetrating. They should not have a negative sign distance. Um, this one, how would you, what kind of a constraint would you write to say, you know, things are not floating in space? Contact force, yeah. More generally, this should be like a free body diagram and it should be a static equilibrium. If you know something about equilibrium, if you know something about even the basic physics and you assume the scene is static, then you should just say forces should balance, right? And if there's not a force that makes that thing at rest, then it's probably not a valid solution. There's one other really good one, okay, which um, I want to talk through. So, um, and I mentioned it sort of before, but this is, if my camera is over here, okay, and it's shooting, you know, somehow it's field of view is here, and my box is here. then the fact that I, fi I get point returns here, here, and here, not only does that tell me I've got some points that I should try to match here, but there's actually a whole bunch more information. And the fact that I got those points from this camera, it also tells me that there's no objects there. Okay, this is like the free space constraints.
Okay, so those are sort of three examples of, of extra things beyond what we've expressed in the point correspondence problem so far. Yeah? It's really, really good question, okay? So the way, how would we write a non-penetration constraint? So first of all, if, well, let's, let's assume we, that the table is fixed. So we just want to say that there's some constraint on the pose such that no point on the mug can possibly be in the table, right? So for instance, I could have a constraint somehow saying x of the object, right? It has to be greater than or equal to 0. Now think about, that's just a hopelessly generic way to, to write a constraint, okay? But it depends on the pose of the mug. How would I evaluate this constraint? This constraint could be the distance of the closest point on the mug to the table. Let me even say signed distance. Okay, if my signed distance between the points on the mug and the table are all greater than or equal to zero, then I've satisfied that non-penetration constraint. Yes, that's true. So, so what she said is that um, in order to write this, I have to have encoded in the program in that, in that f is the position of the table. If you're estimating multiple objects simultaneously, then you might be you know, writing this as a function of x of object 1, x of object 2. More generally, you could think of this as writing a function, sorry to be jumping around on the board here, a function of the configuration vector q, which defines all of the positions of my robot and bodies in the world. We actually have, so implementing that constraint and implementing that constraint in a way that it gives the best gradients possible, because that's a potentially a non-smooth function. If I change q a little bit, the point that is the closest could, be, could change discontinuously. So we actually, um, there's a lot of tools in Drake, for instance, this would be called a minimum distance constraint, minimum distance. Okay, and you can just, you can say, make a mathematical program, you know, add my quadratic objective on the points. Now add a minimum distance constraint saying that the, the minimum distance between these two bodies has to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, and behind the scenes is some computational geometry that is computing those, taking those two bodies, given the current Q, and estimating that min minimum distance. The question is, um, doesn't this, this is a highly nonlinear function potentially, and non-smooth function, doesn't that make the solver have a hard time confining an optimal solution? Yes, it does. I, I, this is not magical. It makes the optimization problem much harder. It will still, like ICP, have the property that if you have a pretty good initial guess, it be, can be surprisingly effective. Okay? In particular, in tracking applications where you find an initial pose, and then you know, track objects as they move, and you only have to adjust. You kind of always have a, if, as long as you're staying on track, you always have a pretty good initial guess. These things can be extremely effective. Okay. The solvers are very, very good. Like, so they're better than, they sh they, than you could hope them for them to be, but these problems are very hard in general. The static equilibrium constraint can be written similarly, but it requires also knowledge of mass, right? But we can use it, we can write similar, and there's also a static equilibrium constraint available in Drake. Do you have a question? Good question. So 
Static equilibrium sounds like a heavy hammer if I just want to say that it's on the table. So in the simple setting of like the mug is on the table, then absolutely you could just say that you know some of the points are zero. But I think you get you quickly find yourself in a more complicated situations where it's not just like I'm stacking mugs, but just I think in, if it's what if the table's slanted or or there's there's situations where writing the heuristics you know solution becomes almost harder than just writing the governing equations and having physics tell you. There's, a, it's a, there's some threshold. I think for flat table, I think you're absolutely right. You could just say, set it on the table, have one of the distances be equal to zero. That would be good. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, so, so he asks, uh, what about using something like diffusion to sort of converge on the constraint mantle? I mean, the uh, almost certainly yes. I think diffusion you know, is very good at learning manifolds, and there's a manifold of possible collision surfaces. The question would be the, the cost of training that model. If it's too environment specific, it might be not worth the, the power of it. I haven't seen that in particular, but probably. Probably, yeah. I mean, it'd be a good project, for instance, if you, if you wanted to try that. Okay, so yeah, static equilibrium. I could. I'm gonna. We're gonna use it more later. It'll be, for instance, one of the ways that we um, find initial conditions of a simulator would be to try to find things that are in static equilibrium and not in penetration. So we'll go back through these a bit later. But effectively, these are nonlinear, non-convex constraints that can be added to the problem. They give you a richer specification than ICP, but they come up with much harder optimization problems. Okay, the free space constraint is actually my favorite. Like, um, I just think it's so easy to underestimate how important that one is, right? Um, so how would we write a free space constraint in in, let's say, to hand to an optimizer? How can we write a function that says no other objects are in that space? Yeah. You could do voxels, but that, so, so the proposal is voxels. You could say, um, you know, there's a lot of voxels maybe in my camera frame, and those should not be in. That could potentially work. The voxels, um, you would need to do something smooth to try to smooth out that ob objective. You don't want to have a um, to check all the voxels independently as independent constraints. Yeah. That's exactly that's my favorite solution. So so did you hear what he says? He, he says. Um, you can actually turn that into a non-penetration constraint problem if you make a fictitious object, which is the geometry is defined by you between the area between your camera and all your returns. You make this object here. Okay, then the same sort of non-penetration constraints, saying this object should not be in penetration with this fictitious object. It's actually a really nice way to write a free space constraint. Not a, it's, it's still an ugly object, you know, a mathematical object, but it's, a, um, it's one that people use on the, on, at, you know, at real-time rates to, to do tracking and the like. There's a, the version, the paper that I like um, that, in, that for, I saw, first saw this is called DART. There's, in robotics, there's like 16 things called DART. Um, this is one of them. Uh, DART, it's a dynamic articulated tracking. Oh, maybe that's just articulated. Maybe it's just dynamic articulated tracking by Tanner Schmidt and all. I think it's just dynamic articulated tracking. Okay. So Tanner put these, did these pre computations of the SDF, made a very fast implementation and was able to track objects that were having non-penetration constraints and uh, free space constraints and, and the like all on the fly, solving these nonlinear optimization problems very fast. 
Okay, there's other subtleties about this sort of point correspondence um, that are sort of I don't know, limitations or just, just you should watch for them, right? So um, one, of the thing, one of the examples I like to think about is uh, imagine you're, you have a thin book on a flat table. Or maybe, maybe a better example. Let's say I'm looking at a door and, I wanna, and what I care about is opening the door handle or something like this, right? So I'm going to get a bunch of returns, points on the, on the door. And getting those points a little bit wrong, the door could shift up or left or right, that's fine. But the, the, door, the few points on the door handle matter so much more than all of those points you're going to get on the door. Okay? If I've got a thin book on a, on a um, table, okay, and I'm getting returns from the top of the book and the returns from the table, like the thing that's going to determine where the book on the table is, is probably the very small number of returns on the boundary that should have really a lot more importance relatively than the massive number of returns I'll get on the table in the book. Okay? So I think there is something fundamentally uh, uninformed about the ICP kind of objectives, and that is a limitation. You know, and I, I, I think that's, I don't have a magic solution to get around that. I just want you to know that I, I feel that it's a limitation. It doesn't have a notion, there's not a canonical notion of like the important points. Treat, all points are treated equally in this. It's very democratic, but it's not always what you want for your robot. Okay? Um, but in that space, it's really, really a very powerful tool. So let me um, show you a couple examples of how well, how it, how it can be used very effectively. Well, first of all, this is um, a simple example, which is in the notes of that uh, non-penetration constraint in action. Okay, so let's say I have the model here, and I have the returns coming from the red, which because of noise somehow were through the wall. I put this a, like a, a box in the corner. Okay, so the green is supposed to be the area you're not supposed to go, and you know that your box should be on the in the positive orthant here, okay, but I'm getting returns that are negative. So solving that non-penetration constraint, which is a handful of lines of code and mathematical program, can find the best solution, which is, you know, minimizing those distances that is outside the constraint. And yeah, maybe even before I, I finish, let me, let me show you a couple more of those examples. So um, the way you do that in, in mathematical program just the way we added quadratic costs, for instance, in the QP, you can add generic costs, which are just defined with a Python function. And Drake will try to take gradients through those functions. Every once in a while, you'll type something that I can't, we can't take a gradient through. But most of the time, it just works. Okay. So you can, you, that's, that's how you would add these richer objectives. And in that example right there, what, we, what I did is I took this original um, objective, okay, added those costs, but it turns out that that square distance function, and so there's also um, constraints saying that those positions have to all be um, outside the, you know, in the positive orthant. So that's the basic mechanics of this, of this problem, is just add constraints saying that in my reconstructed thing, all of the points need to be positive x and positive y. And those you just add as costs and add as generic costs and constraints. And the implementation of this square distance function and the implementation of this position in world are potentially these nonlinear functions. The position model in world is taking, um, in this case, the decision variable was just theta. I didn't even parameterize the rotation matrix. I just parameterized theta since I'm already doing nonlinear optimization. And I computed the position of the model in the world as a function of theta using our spatial algebra, okay? The square distance then is this position of the model in world, okay, turned into an error function and squared. But I'm writing basically natural Python code, and when the optimizer tries to solve it, what it will do is it'll evaluate these functions with, on the decision variables, and it'll take the gradients of those functions in order to try to walk down the landscape. That is the full program that made that box come out of the corner, but otherwise minimize the ICP objective. We'll give you a lot more experience uh, with those kind of things when, when you need them. Okay, so 
here's a couple examples of, I think, ICP sort of, even though it's limited, there's some ways that are sort of, I think, very effective in the wild, okay, today. And this is, um, this is one's called label fusion. Let me just pause it for a second. So when everybody started trying to train deep networks to do pose estimation, one of the challenges was to um, have ground truth labels. Okay, there's only a handful of ways that people uh, do that now. One of them is actually in simulation. You just put ground truth, you generate a bunch of synthetic images, you have ground truth poses, and you have pairs that you can train a supervised learning system on image and pose, image and pose, image and pose. But it's much better to do that on real world data. Okay, so one of the early pipelines for doing that on real world data um, used ICP. Okay, now ICP isn't strong enough to solve the problem, otherwise we wouldn't have had to train a deep network. But with a simple GUI, so this, like this project, basically you would take a quick, a bunch of pictures of the scene, you'd do some dense reconstruction to try to make them into one set at one point cloud, okay? And then you'd offer it up to a human who would just click like three points on the scene point cloud and three points on the model, and they're just super fast. Like, do, 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 do three clicks, and that was just enough to have an initial guess. That's enough, typically, for ICP to do the rest of the work. Okay, and the cool thing is, since you took a bunch of camera images in order to get a nice view or whatever, you also could, once you have that clicked once, you can actually go back to all of those camera images and label them with the ground truth label, knowing the geometry of the camera and everything, right? You can say, in all of those, you know, 100 images or something, I know the pose of the object relative to the camera. You generate a lot of data very fast. And that works very well. That was, a, I think, a, a leading pipeline for a while, or things like that were leading pipelines. Um, I, I would still do this today if I was trying to make a real world data set myself of, uh, for deep pose estimation. Right? Now you can just go through all of your data and all these different images where you've just identified it once as a ground truth label for the, for the in the messy scene. Okay, but there's another, this is why I was, I made the joke about mustard in Rome before. Okay, um, there's another, there's other places where you'll see basically this ICP point correspondence solved, sometimes at massive scales, okay? And they're still used very much today. Like everybody who's doing NERF is probably doing this first. Okay, for instance. So um, this is Colmap, which is one of the most popular ones, which is lar one of the first sort of large scale structure from motion. It's a, almost an analogy. There's different differences in that problem a little bit, which I can talk to. But um, the, this was just going online, right? The Rome data set is going online and a bunch of pictures of people taking pictures around Rome. And the problem was to go back and figure out where their cameras were and merge those, the, their individual cameras into a coherent 3D model of, of Rome. And it's like shockingly good. It's crazy how good it is. You don't, you don't even have to send a robot out there, just go on Flickr, right? Incredibly good. Okay, so the way Colmap works is there's details, and there's lots of details, and I'm, I haven't covered structure for motion properly. But I do think that the, the background we have now from ICP and the like can, gives you what you need to read the coal map paper properly, right? So you'll see, you know, first step, figure out correspondences, okay? There's a lot of work in coal map to do it at very large scales. And you have many, many, many images, and you want to first figure out even what images might have correspondences, right? So there's a lot of efficiency uh, optimizations that, that make this incredibly uh, good. But they use yeah, features, um, so they're not just using every point cloud. They're going to, they actually, or, you know, they they don't have a depth camera, right? Random people putting images on Flickr didn't take depth images, so in the structure from motion problem, you had to go straight from raw images. And one of the ways you do that is you just use these generic features. Sift features are the most common ones. You don't have to know that as a detail, but that's a name you'll see often. Okay. There's, way, there's standard algorithms that kind of look for features in the image and, and mark them as an important point in, point in the image. And they have a, it's a vector of features, and you can look for similar features in different images. 
decide that they correspond, and you start these approximate correspondence algorithms. Okay, and then in the heart of this is the bundle adjustment, which is almost point set registration problem. And in fact, it looks almost identical to what we just said. One of the key differences is that um, this pi here, it, almost, it looks almost exactly like the loss function I, I wrote, right? But this, this pi here is going, projecting points in 2D through the camera at an unknown pose of the camera. And instead of wrapping the objects around or the entire scene around, they're actually moving the camera around. And that's these, the, the unfortunately their X is their data and my X is my transform. But that's, that's just a coincidence. Okay, but, but almost identical objective function. They're solving very efficiently. You know, they're, not, they're not just handing that whole thing and, and going. There's a lot of algorithms that make that more efficient. But the basis is exactly what we've been talking about here. Okay, and you know, when you go to build a neural radiance field or a, do Gaussian splatting or whatever the newest uh, 3D reconstruction from deep learning community is, um, you'll see that if you're bringing raw images or your raw video or something like this, the first step still today is to use Colmap to figure out where the heck your camera was. And if you don't do that, you tend to not get scale information. So Nerf by itself, yeah, typically you will start with using these very geometric perception algorithms to just yeah, understand how to align all those images into, into a one neural radiance field. So I think one of the you know, more boutique lectures as we get to it in the end, and you'll have a little bit of choose your own adventure, I think it'd be fun to have an you know, entire lecture about some of the dense reconstructions and the newer neural description, descriptive stuff. Um, so, but we'll see if, if you pick that later in the term. Cool. That's it, I'll see you next time.